Uh, first of all, let me just uh, tell you that I'm not a relationship guru. Uh, I'm not like those people on afternoon television. And the only thing I have to offer is that I'm an expert in how to do research on relationships. And I've studied uh, over 3,000 couples over the last 32 years. You know, couples very much like yourselves. And, uh, and what I've tried to do is find out what it is they do to make their relationships work. And we've also studied gay and lesbian couples as well as heterosexual couples for a very long time. And I've done this work with my friend Bob Levinson, who's a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, it's our 30th anniversary, actually, this year of working together. And what we really brought to this whole area was profound ignorance, because we really didn't have a clue about what made relationships work when we started doing this research 30 years ago. And so what we did is we made videotapes of couples doing ordinary things like talking about how their day went and talking about an area of conflict, continuing disagreement. And at the University of Washington, I built an apartment laboratory that was kind of like a bed and breakfast getaway in which uh, we had couples just hang out for 24 hours. And uh, there was a beautiful picture window there and boats going by and, uh, and you know, people just sort of listened to the music they wanted to listen to, watch television, brought newspapers to read and did whatever they wanted to do. And the only difference between that setting and an ordinary bed and breakfast was that we had four cameras bolted to the wall and they wore uh, Holter monitors that measured two channels of electrocardiogram. And when they urinated, we took a urine sample to measure stress hormones uh, in their urine. And we took blood from them uh, to measure how their immune system was functioning. And there were people in the other room recording their facial expressions of emotion. But aside from that, it was like an ordinary bed and breakfast getaway. <laughs> And uh, we found, you know, what we basically did was study, you know, representative samples of couples. And we started with newlyweds in one study, for example. We're now in the 13th year of studying those couples. As they had kids, we studied them in pregnancy and as their, their babies developed. And then we studied kids who, uh, we studied families who were uh, in midlife, who had young kids couples in their 40s, couples in their 60s, all the way through retirement. Our current study is about 20 years we follow couples. So we didn't know if there were good relationships or bad relationships when we started. And we found out that over time, some of, them, some of the relationships broke up and some of them fell apart. Some of them stayed together and were really unhappy with one another. And others, you know, kind of more or less liked each other over time and the relationships got better and better and they, they were pretty happy. And we called that last group the masters of relationships and the other group the disasters, the ones whose relationships fell apart or stayed together and weren't happy. And what we tried to find out was, was there anything different about the masters and the disasters? Was there anything we could figure out about it? And we were very surprised uh, to find out that we could predict which couples would stay together and which ones would get a divorce with over 90% accuracy. And you, know, you don't find that kind of prediction in psychology very often. Usually, we can't predict people's behavior at all. But here in relationships, we were able to predict with enormous accuracy what would happen to a relationship. In fact, in just 15 minutes of a couple talking about an area of continuing disagreement, we could predict with 85% accuracy whether they get divorced. And not only that, uh, after following couples for 14 years, we could not only predict if they would get divorced, but when they would get divorced as well. So I want to tell you about that research and what we discovered from this and how we put it all together in kind of a theory about what makes relationships work and what the principles are for making them, uh, making them get better and better and also turning around ones that are really unhappy. Now, this ability to predict divorce with very high accuracy or happiness with very high accuracy hasn't done a lot for my personal life. I don't get invited out to dinner very much, for example. You know. <laughs> very few couples want to know if their relationship is going to work or not. Uh, and in the middle of a fight, my wife is very likely to say to me, if they could see you now. You know. uh, so, but we try to use the principles, my wife and I, we try to figure out you know, what, how we can make our relationship better. And in fact, uh, we do a workshop in Seattle where the second day, uh, every time we do the workshop, my wife and I talk about a fight we just had. And we're never at a loss. We always have a fight to talk about. 
And we do this in front of 150 couples. Uh, and so, you know, part of what I want to tell you is that what we've learned in studying good relationships, as well as the disasters, is that we're all really in the same soup. So let me start by talking about what it is we learned that allows us to predict divorce or stability with very high accuracy. The first thing we found was that if you take a look at the ratio of positive stuff during conflict, things like interest, asking questions, being nice to one another, being kind, being affectionate, being empathetic, and you look at all the negative stuff like criticism, hostility, anger, uh, hurt feelings, and you take the ratio of positive to negative, in relationships that stay together, that ratio turns out to be five to one. There's five times as many positive things going on in relationships that work as negative. So that's an interesting equation. And it sort of suggests that if you do something negative to hurt your partner's feelings, you know, that you have to make up for it with five positive things. So the equation is not balanced in terms of positive and negative. Negative has a lot more ability to inflict pain and damage than positive things have to heal and bring you closer. Now, the couples who wound up divorced, that ratio was 0.8 to 1. So there was a little more negativity than positivity in couples who were heading for divorce. So first of all, uh, for a relationship to feel right, it has to be a very rich climate of affection and humor and fun and intimacy and empathy. Now in the apartment lab that I mentioned, that ratio is more like 20 to 1 rather than 5 to 1, right? So when you're just hanging out, it really needs to be an enormously rich climate of positive stuff. Interestingly enough, you might think that from that finding, what you want to do is, if you're a therapist, you want to declare war on negativity and eliminate all anger, sadness, hurt feelings from relationships. And that's not true. It turns out negativity is actually very productive in relationships because hurt feelings and negativity wind up, for one thing, calling out stuff that doesn't work in relationships, right? You hurt your partner's feelings, you learn something, right? And you talk about how to make it better next time. So you don't want a relationship where there's nothing negative going on. The other thing is it wouldn't be very real if there wasn't sadness, disappointment, you know, and there's kind of a cycle of getting closer and drawing apart uh, that happens in relationships after a fight, people are distant for a while, and then they get closer together. So that in fact, in relationships, as a result of negativity, there's a need to continually renew courtship in relationships. And so that's the importance of that finding about negativity and not declaring war on negativity. You don't want to get rid of anger. You don't want to get rid of sadness. You know, that's kind of our inheritance when we have a close relationship. We get all the emotions. Now, the next thing that Bob and I wanted to know was, are all negative things equally corrosive? Are there some things that really are a lot more negative than others? And in fact, there are. And I wound up calling those things the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And because there were four things that really were very predictive of divorce. And they were characteristic of the disasters and very different from the masters. And the masters are dealing with conflict in this way. It's kind of like if I was holding, imagine I was holding an invisible soccer ball right here, okay? And this soccer ball represents our problem. And my wife and I are kicking this ball around. And that's the way the masters deal with things. Now, the disasters from the beginning try to put that ball in their partner's body. And they're really saying, you're the problem, right? So the first horseman of the apocalypse is what we call criticism. And criticism is a way of complaining that suggests that your partner's personality is defective, okay? And now, what are the masters doing? The masters are still complaining, right? But they're talking about themselves, talking about their feelings, and what they need. So let's say, for example, I complain. And I want to complain the way, you know, a really great relationship would complain. I might say to my wife something like, you know, you talked about yourself all through dinner. You never asked me anything about my day. And that hurt my feelings. I really need you to ask me about my day. Okay? So there I'm talking about myself, what I feel, and what I need, right? Now, the disasters would try to make that just a symptom of my wife's defect. And I would say to my wife something like, 
You know, you talked about yourself during dinner. You never asked me anything about my day. What is wrong with you? This is a great question, right? What is wrong with you? Does anybody ever answer that question? Hey, I'm glad you asked that. Let me take a look and see what's wrong, you know? It's not really a question, right? Now, the second horseman of the apocalypse kind of follows from the first, because if you feel criticized, you're going to be feeling attacked, and you're going to be warding off this attack, right? And that's defensiveness, the second horseman of the apocalypse. And we found there are two ways of becoming defensive that are most common in couples. The first is righteous indignation. And in righteous indignation, what you're doing is meeting a complaint with a counter complaint. The second way of being defensive is I can act like an innocent victim. And the most common way people act like an innocent victim is they whine. I cared about your day. I really did. I was really interested in your day. Now, what's the, what's the opposite? What's the constructive alternative? What do the masters do instead of get defensive? It's very simple. They accept responsibility, even for a small part of the problem. So she says to me, all through dinner, you talked about yourself. You never asked me about my day. I can say, God, good point. You know, I really was stressed out, you know, during dinner. And the drive home was awful. I had a rotten day. I don't think I was listening to anybody, you know, the whole day. And you're right. I probably wasn't listening to you. So how was your day? Now, the third horseman is our best predictor of divorce. And it is disrespect and contempt. Now, contempt is a little bit different than criticism because in contempt, you feel superior to your partner. You're speaking from a higher plane, kind of like I'm on this podium and I'm talking down. Well, if you do that to your partner, you feel, let's say you feel cleaner than your partner or more punctual or tidier or smarter than your partner, then you're going to kind of talk down to your partner and the comment that will come out will be this kind of snobby, contemptuous comment, right? Now, how do people get contemptuous? The most common way they do that is by calling their partner names or directly insulting them. And, you know, so you can say, you know, what a jerk. You only talk about yourself. Now, we would like our partners to respond to us by saying something like, John, that's brilliant. You're su such an observant person. You know, thank you for pointing out all the ways in which I'm failing as a human being. Can we have lunch next week so you can tell me more? You know, but unfortunately, people don't respond that way, right? They really wind up getting hurt. In fact, contempt is our single best predictor of divorce. Now, what is it that the masters are doing that's the alternative for contempt? What is the opposite of disrespect? It is not doing nothing. It is really respect and being proud of the people we love. And what the masters are doing is creating in the relationship a culture of appreciation. They're saying thank you for very small things that their partners are doing. Thanks for picking up the laundry. I enjoyed the conversation at dinner. I watched you playing with the baby last night, and it was really beautiful. We had that teacher conference, and you know, that teacher really intimidates me. You've got a lot of guts. So it's communicating not only affection, but respect, right? That's the culture of appreciation. Now, how do you build that? And what, the way you build it is you start really creating a different habit of mind, a habit of mind where instead of scanning the environment for things to criticize and put down and make yourself superior through putting down other people, you scan the environment for things you can praise and appreciate. And this is as important in, uh, in love relationships as it is in parent-child relationships, looking for stuff you can appreciate. Catch your partner doing something right. Now, the fourth horseman of the apocalypse we call stonewalling. And here's what stonewalling is. It's really emotional withdrawal from conflict. And here's the way we actually measure it in our laboratory. Usually when a, when a listener is uh, listening to somebody talk, they actually give the speaker a lot of signals that they are tracking, that they're, that they're there, not necessarily agreeing. They maintain their sort of an open body. They maintain eye contact, nod their heads. They utter these brief vocalization. Oh, yeah, uh huh, uh They move their faces. Oh, yeah, could be. Oh, yeah, sure. Good. And so all of these signals are coming out. The stonewaller doesn't do that. Maybe folds arms akimbo like that, looks down and away. There's no facial movement. There's no vocalization. And maybe an occasional glance at the speaker just to see if the ogre has magically disappeared. That's stonewalling. Now, 
What does stonewalling do? You know, what it does is that the speaker doesn't think he or she is getting through, right? So instead of getting out the 40-pound cannon, when they're stonewalling, the speaker gets out the 60-pound cannon. Boom! You know, let's really have an impact, right? So those are the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and they allow us to predict with high accuracy what's going to happen to a relationship. But, you know, that's kind of like the recipe for failure, right? And the recipe, the alternative recipe for constructive conflict resolution is interesting and useful in some way, but it doesn't give you enough information about what it is that the, in good relationships is really happening to maintain that intimacy in the relationship. And here's what we discovered about that. From looking at the apartment lab, we actually came out with a number of principles that really could be useful in building a relationship. So let me tell you about these principles. The first thing that we found was that in good relationships, friendship is extremely important. It's not just about conflict and how you deal with conflict. It's about intimacy and maintaining intimacy. Now the cool thing about being a researcher is you cannot just talk about things in vague terms. You have to really measure stuff and so you have to be really precise about the advice you give. And what we found was there are three ingredients to friendship and that's all you needed to do was work on those three things and you could, you could have an intimate friendship in your relationship. And here's what the three things are. First, first thing was to enhance what we call your love maps. Now what's a love map? It's an internal road map that you make up, that you have in your mind, about your partner's inner world, inner psychological world. So this is the whole dimension of being known, of feeling like your partner is really interested in knowing you, and of feeling like, you know, you want to know your partner. So it's about interest in one another, right? And it's about knowing, like, you know, who are the main people in your, in your partner's world? Uh, what's stressing your partner out? What's exciting? Uh, what are some of your partner's dreams and hopes and aspirations and values, right? Now, how do you find that information out? Asking questions. So the fundamental process is really asking questions. Now, not questions like, did the plumber come, right? But open-ended questions like, how are you feeling about being a mother right now? How do you like this house? Do you want to change it? How are you thinking about your job right now? Have you changed? How would you like our life to be in the next five years? Those kinds of questions. They help build the love map. Now, the cool thing about this is some people make these love maps naturally, and some people just don't do it. So when you talk to people who don't make love maps, and you tell them about how important it is, they go, OK, so how do I do that? And if you show them how to do it, then they go, OK, I'll do it. Now, if you want to really try changing your life, in the area of relationships in the next two weeks. Try making 50% of the things you say to people a question, an open-ended question. Instead of making statements to people, ask them questions. And you'll find that people really change because people rarely ask questions. It's a very, very fundamental thing to do. And yet it's a very rare thing. People mostly make statements and broadcast rather than saying, well, what do you think about this? Asking those kinds of questions. So love maps is the first ingredient of friendship. The second one is what we call fondness and admiration. And I mentioned that in the culture of appreciation. It's really about communicating affection and respect in very small ways. And that's what the masters are doing. They're creating this culture of appreciation in very tiny ways. They're saying, thank you, I'm proud of you, I really admire you, I respect you. And they're doing it often. Now, let me tell you about a couple that we saw. And this guy, you know, was... Uh, very successful in his career, and he ran uh, an intensive care unit for, for babies in a major hospital in Los Angeles. And he and his wife had been married for 17 years, and I talked to him about the very first date he had with his wife. And he said, God, you know, I was thinking that first date that of all the women I'd ever met, she was the most vivacious, the most exciting, the most beautiful, the most intelligent woman I'd ever met. I went, wow. Now, there's a fondness and admiration system, right? Now, the next thing I wanted to know was, did his wife know this, that he was thinking this on the first date? In fact, in 17 years, had he ever told her that he thought this about her? And so I, I asked her, I said, did you know this? She said, I never had a clue. 
So what's the fundamental thing in fondness and admiration? It can't stay in the brain. It's got to come out the mouth, right? So that's really what the masters are doing. In very small ways, they're saying thank you. I mean, even for trivial things, thanks for doing the dishes, you know. Even if it's that person's turn to do the dishes, right? A lot of couples say, well, why should I say thank you? I just do stuff. He does stuff. Why should we say thank you to each other? I don't get much appreciation. And I always say, do you like that? Do you like feeling unappreciated? No. Well, do you both feel unappreciated? Yes. Okay. So that's so express appreciation. It's not very complicated. It's very simple. And it helps this habit of mind, right? Where you're scanning the environment for things to appreciate. So that's love maps, fondness and admiration, right? Respect and affection. The third is something we learned from the apartment lab, is that when people are just hanging out, the way they build intimacy is in very tiny moments. They make little bids, B-I-D-S, for emotional connection. Now, it's at the lowest level, they're making bids for their partner's attention. You know, like, for example, you know, I can look out the window of the apartment lab where boats were going by, and I can say, well, there's a pretty boat. Okay, now, let's say that my wife says that, and I'm cleaning my glasses, right? And she says, there's a pretty boat. No response. We call that turning away, right? Sometimes, somebody be cleaning their glasses. Here's a pretty boat. Huh. Now, that's a pretty minimal response, right? But it's turning toward. It's some response. Sometimes, people would turn toward a bid in a very enthusiastic way, like, there's a pretty boat. Wow, that is a pretty boat. You know, say, did you ever think, why don't we quit our jobs like and get a boat like that and just kind of sail off together? So we call that an enthusiastic turning toward, right? Rather than just, you know, a turning toward without enthusiasm. And what we found was very interesting, that what happens if I make a bid for just her attention and she turns away? She doesn't respond at all. You know, what are the chances? I say, hey, there's a pretty boat. No response. I'm going to say, hey, Julie, I said, there's a pretty boat. You know? The probability of rebidding is almost zero in all relationships. It actually is zero in the couples, the newlyweds who wound up divorcing six years later. And 0.22, 22% probability in couples who stayed together. It's still very low, right? And in fact, on the videotape, what you see is if people, if partners turn away, they kind of crumple a little bit, you know, and they do some face-saving things like straightening up or petting the cat, you know, or something like that. But they don't rebid. That lack of connection is really painful. And we started realizing that in these very tiny moments of emotional connection, people are building kind of an emotional bank account in the relationship. They're building up points in that relationship that builds emotional connection. Okay, those are the three components of intimacy. Making a love map, right, and updating it periodically by asking questions. Fondness and admiration, and turning toward, okay? Now, when those three things are working, then it turns out people are in a state of mind that we call positive sentiment override. Now, it's a fancy term, but it means that my positive sentiment for my wife and the relationship overrides momentary times when she's irritable or we're feeling a little distant. But if those three parts of friendship are not working very well, love maps, fondness and admiration, and turning toward, then I'll be in negative sentiment override. And that means I've got a chip on my shoulder, right? I mean, if I'm in negative sentiment override, she can come down one morning to the kitchen and say, in a very sweet way, you know, honey, you're not supposed to run the microwave when there's no food in it. And if I got that chip on my shoulder, I'm going to say, don't you tell me how to run the microwave. I'm the one who reads the manuals around here. You're not going to control and manipulate me. See, I've got a chip on my shoulder. I'm hypervigilant for put downs. I'm in a negative state. And you, know, you can't tell me to not be so sensitive about the relationship, you know, to lighten up, not take it so personally. To, you can't tell me, well, she said it in a sweet way. I can't get out of negative sentiment override, right? So research studies that have tried to change people's cognitive style about the relationship fail. And they fail for good reason, because love maps aren't working, fondness and admiration, 
and turning toward aren't working. That's what I got, why I got that chip on my shoulder, right? But if they're working, I'm in positive sentiment over it. She can say in a very irritable way, hey, you're not supposed to run the microwave, but there's no fool in <laughs> And if I'm in positive sentiment override, I'll say, okay. I'm not taking that personally, right? You know, I'm seeing that as maybe she's stressed out. I'm thinking, this lady's very involved in the microwave today. I don't know why, you know, but uh, I'm not going to ask her now, you know. Uh, but, you know, basically, you know, it's a buffer. Positive sentiment override is a buffer against irritability and emotional distance. Mm -hmm.